away the Thresh and banning the Alistair. It feels like you can kind of plug and play Alistair into most situations that Thresh is a reliable pick. What are they prioritizing and what champions can you not let Anarchy have? Yeah, I think that Anarchy is so dangerous on red side with that counter pick because we know Mickey can take over games on set. In that way, maybe you ban Zed here. The question for me is whether Anarchy will be the first team to not ban Victor against Kuro because it's just been blanket banned against the Koo Tigers ever since uh, he was re-enabled on 510. And it is a champion who is susceptible to all-in assassins that plays right into Mickey's champion pool. So that would be quite the gambit to throw open, but Kuro innovating Victor, at least in terms of the competitive play in the last six to eight months, it hasn't been sin, but it's possible. So now I'm a little bit worried. The Hecarim, uh, actually a ban, even though we know Smev is a great NAR player and maybe could deal with that in the laning phase. The issue I see here is now that Zed and Thresh are still available. Rise also. Yeah. Not a lot of auto ban champions actually banned away. Finally, we see one of the stand standard champion bans in Alistair join the ban pool. Thresh takeaway would maybe solve things, but if you're Anarchy, there's a potential that you could ban the Rise, leave it open. What do you do here? Because Smeb, has he played the Rise this season? Uh, no. I mean, he hasn't had an option to, I don't think. So that would be a definite first pick. But they're going to give away Gragas or Rise or both. Evelyn going to be the ban. So Anarchy going to get the Gragas at the least. And Lyra's a great on that champion. Gragas Thresh could actually be the duo picked away. But no Callista's available. This has been a weird ban phase. A lot being left up at the moment. Rise the priority, though. And look at this. What is Ixu going to play in this game? They banned out the two big champions we've seen Ixu rely on so far. They get the Rise. So you have to believe that Smeb is this big time carry top laner right now. is just going to have a field day with Ixu. There's so much available as Kuro does lock in the victor that's been perma banned against oh him this season. My. Well, this is going to be interesting at least. I feel like Ixu almost has to opt into the rumble. That's the only pick that he's shown that kind of doesn't necessarily deal well with Ryze, but can go competitive in lane. It's good to gank for. Kalista. And Cannon was the duo they picked when they beat KT and is available again now. Mickey picking Echo this early will be a surprise, but it is certainly possible. Yeah, I, I'm i really a little bit confused by what's going on here in this draft, just because, I mean, look, Sivir hasn't even been picked yet. The Callista, the priority, and now Ku has that opportunity to get a big engage with Sivir, Annie, and Rise. This is not the worst game to lock in Yasuo, but what a gambit it would be. Uh, I would be impressed. Because Gragas, of course, excellent synergy with the Yasuo. I don't see why you would commit to it this early. Of course, you are picking against a Victor that's already been locked in. We're waiting for the timer to run down. We are expecting the that's cannon. That goes for the Kassan, the more reliable option. Now, remember, they don't have Sivir this game. They've already opted into Callista. They're regular wave clear options. I mean, Sivir has that instant line wave clear. Callista's no slouch when she gets some time, so maybe you have to go Hurricane Callista in this particular situation. But Siv has been available, was always going to be the answer. And this is quite the draft being put together by the Koo Tigers. This is like, oh no, not the Praven. <laughs> he always trolls this because his Draven play is among the worst that I have ever seen from a pro player. Yeah, the Sivir is, he knows it too. That's the whole joke now is Bray trolls himself. <laughs> but what a lineup the Koo has put together. Now you even have the On the Hunt to synergize and help Rise get into the back line with that flat movement speed to complement the Desperate Power Ultimate. Anarchy are left having to pick a support. Of, no, they have a support. Of course, we are expecting Cannon. So they're thinking about the top lane. Do you have to opt in to Rumble here? And where do you go? As you mentioned, Hecarim and Maokai, uh, those were the two expected picks. Both of them banned out. The problem is, is that you're so low damage in the early game if you have the Rumble. Uh, Kalista's great at the 1v1s and at bullying in lane and securing objectives, but not the highest damage pickup. Are they thinking about Gragas top? Or Lee top? I don't really know what you would play into this rise. You have to have kill pressure up there, and that may be the answer. It's certainly terrible late. 
Okie dokie. So we don't know what to expect in the top lane. Lee Sin, of course, good AD scaling, good in lane, but doesn't really itemize, doesn't really scale with items well. Gragas could go Rod of Ages, maybe like Nautilus and other champs, and honestly, go a similar build to Rise, except not have to build the tier. Excellent ranged wave clear. Maybe this is their source of wave clear. Get a bit of AP onto Gragas. Okay, you have to wait for the barrel to hit that red stack, you know, let it sit there for a couple of seconds, but it gives the wave clear that this team kind of desperately needs. Yeah, that is. That is very true. That wave clear is such a big, big factor right now. And you know, honestly, with the way the Koo Tigers have been playing early, they, they have such great pushing potential with the Sivir and the Victor quickly in this game that they could really snowball off of tower kills. And you talk about Rod of Ages, well, that's a lot of scaling between a Cassidin and a top Gragas. And that Callista doesn't put out enough damage in the mid game to really do anything at all to the Ku Tigers. You remember though, Sung Yun went Hurricane first on Callista. The first time we saw that in Champions this season. You could still go right to and Gragas and deal with the base damages. The Q base damage is quite high, it would still provide the wave clear. Very interesting to see how Anarchy play around the top side of the map, because Gragas is a great lane for Lee Sin to gank for. Yeah, that is definitely true. Smeb going to have to. Play very, very safe, but Smeb the kind of player that can really just haul his team to a victory in the late game. Anarchy versus Koo, let's get into game one. It's time for some pirate rise. Silence. Oh, wow. Anarchy fans. <laughs> uh, there are none, apparently. There was good Anarchy chance the last time we saw. In fact, it looked like their fan group was growing, so that's... Uh, I don't know if that affects the confidence of the players. We'd hope not, but uh, interesting to see. They can't hear it, Bob. They're in booths. That's fair. I'm not used to booths, Monte Cristo. <laughs> So This is a really interesting draft in a lot of ways. Now, you're giving away Rise to a carry top laner like Smeb. And when I say carry top laner, I mean he has that kind of identity. He plays Riven top. He's basically innovator Riven top this season, 3-0 and on that champion. Rise's carry potential against a melee champion. It's a scary lane for Gragas, but Gragas has sustain. Gragas has ranged wave clear. And he's a great lane for Lee Sin to gain for. So you have to expect a lot of tension up top. You're isolating Mickey against Kuro on the Kassadin versus Victor matchup. We know that this matchup goes very decently for Kassadin. His only issue is he doesn't have the wave clear to match the line wave clear of Victor. Yeah, and that's the big issue here is how long can Anarchy hold on to their towers? Because if Ku gets early turrets and they're allowed to start grouping up before these Rod of Ages, which we're assuming Ixu is also going to buy, really start to stack up. That is going to be a massive problem. They are, they've balanced it out with the early game potency of the Ken and Callista lane in the Lee Sin, but there's a lot of weakness on the top side of the map uh, from Anarchy. We might see a different identity from Snowfire this time on the Ken, and we noted previously that it was Ken and picked into Alistair last time, and of course doesn't have the engage option. In this game, there is decent backline dive potential. It's probably going to have to be Peel, but it is there. Yeah, Snowflower and uh, Sangyun actually took the small golem at the blue buff right there, and they gave all of that experience over to Snowflower. So let's see what this, he's going to hit level two fast here, uh, off of the first wave, more than likely. So what is the, what is the, what are they planning to do with this? And they're going to need one or two more minions. But it is going to be slightly early. Of course, does have CC potential at level two. It's difficult to pull off, given the cooldowns on Q and E, I guess. But uh, certainly possible. Well, our observer noticed that they got it and then decided not to actually follow up with that. He did hit level two and take a chunk out of Gorilla, but nothing really happening there. And now Ixu going to be teleporting into top lane. And that W really gonna hurt. And it's only level one W. This lane probably change at level four. That's when melee range auto attacks probably gonna be difficult for the Gragas. And there we go, 100% win rate on Victor for Kuro, 100% win rate on Cassidin for Mickey. So somebody's streak will be snapped tonight. And Brain Gorilla just down here playing a little bit safe as they would want to in this bottom side until maybe they can get level six and actually affect an all-in. 
It's unique, this game, in a lot of ways, especially with the Gragas vs. Ryze matchup in top lane on patch 5.10. But to me, the unique factor is itemization is no given for most of the champions on this map. I feel like playing around your item power spikes might actually dictate how the early game goes, because we expect Anarchy to opt into lots of power chops, but they don't 100% have to outside of Mickey on Cassidy. And the question here, too, is will Prey do what we've seen some Sivers do and actually build Bloodthirster first? Because that's not a bad option in this game. If they want to get that really fast siege and punish the lack of wave clear, it could be quite good. A lot of incidental damage coming through from Anarchy. Lots of magic damage in general. Gragas, Cassidy, and even Kennen does very high base damages. So the Bloodthirster on a 500 range champion like Siva might allow him to disregard the overshield, just position more aggressively. So I wouldn't mind that adaptation. But there's no guarantee. A lot of Sivas happy to pick up BF Sword, pickaxe into an Avarice Blade, and just go the standard IE route. Yes, indeed. And now. Uh, just an early recall for a tier, so Smeb had saved his TP, so he's able to start stacking that item immediately. And he's just going to catch that wave very easily. The mid and top of the Ku Tiger has been playing back a little bit this game, and that's prevented Lyra from getting an angle onto Kuro. He was looking for one just a little bit ago. Got a ward down. We'll see Wisdom. But Wisdom going to be right there as Kuro shoves that lane forward. In the late game, Callista is going to be so, so safe, Monte Cristo. We see lots of hyper carry comms. The likes of Jinx get preyed upon by a Hecarim. But Callista this game, Explosive Cask disengage, Lee Sin Kick disengage, and the Slicing Maelstrom probably going to be used for peel. Maybe this is the game to go into the Hurricane and maybe opt into fights around the Dragon, because very early in this game, it's going to be hard to get on top of this Callista. Yeah, but you you only need that one pick sure. with the Annie to make that very difficult. Wisdom wants to start ganking into this bottom sign. There is no Lee Sin there. He is up counter jungling at top. There's the flash W. Wisdom's here. He's going to punish that flash immediately. Song Yoon goes down for first blood for Wisdom. That was some great patience, actually, not even showing until the flash had already been used by Song Yoon. Still a very common spot to gank for Monte Cristo. It needs to start being warded around five minutes into the game. You do fall prey to what is a Shaco-esque gank route that has a very high rate of success. Yeah, that is, that is definitely true, but you know, you can't ward everywhere. No, it's true. However, you also have a Callista, so we could talk about the fact that there weren't any Sentinels there also. You could path your Sentinel around the blue buff and check that brush. Look, it's not 100% reliable, but at least making the token effort to appease us analysts <laughs> needs to happen. And that's what I like. Bobby Being Smithy. appeased. Being appeased. That's, uh, that's basically all I look for in life. That's a pretty good way to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... Look at the CS in mid lane. Mickey's up 15 CS against a Victor. CSing is usually not a big problem for Victor. Maybe that's just poor use of mana in terms of balancing harass and wave clear, but that strikes me as a pretty damn big advantage. Yeah, it is. But Coral also has been playing really, really defensively this game. Um, he hasn't really had much jungle support, and Lyra was on the hunt for a kill right there, so... He may be making this decision constant, uh, consciously. Sped with a CS advantage, and then the first blood being picked up in the bottom lane does even things out for this Sivir as well. And they're going to be able to opt into another all-in once Gorilla hits six. So we'll see. But again, we've talked about this. Mickey getting out of control is Anarchy's ticket to victory a lot of the time. In the interview after their previous series, they talked about adapting their playstyle around ganking mid. I'm pretty sure that's always been their playstyle. I'm going to point my finger at that particular interview and say, look, playing around Mickey is definitely Anarchy's primary win condition. The items, we wanted to discuss them. It is the recurve bow first. Now, we've seen plenty of recurve bow into BF Sword Bloodthirster rushes, but Sung Yoon is the unique player that does like to prioritize the Hurricane early. It gives you a lot of wave pushing advantages, but also pigeonholes you into pushing because, of course, you can't freeze the wave when the bolts are hitting the other minions. I mean, I'm just not a fan of the Hurricane first, but I do think that in this particular situation, due to the team comp that Anarchy is running, it is the smarter choice. Stay back, have lots of peel for the Callista. At risk, of course, of the Flash Tibbers, but then just stay back and ensure that you're not in range. And the itemization at top, it's probably not going to be a lot of aggression by Mickey 
on Takura. It looks like it's not going to be Rod of Ages, given that it's not going to be the Catalyst finished first, but certainly leaving the options open. I'm thinking Righteous Glory and a Spectre's Cow. Yeah, the Glory could definitely be a pretty solid item and just turning him into a tank instead of much more of a damage threat. But again, if he has no damage, this team really lacks mid-game punch at all. They just don't have enough damage to really deal with the Tigers comparatively. I mean, that Victor Rise Sivir combo is going to be extraordinarily high damage. Kassadin and Kalista do damage eventually. You'd eventually. Say Rise does as well. But when I say eventually, I don't necessarily mean 30 minutes. I mean over time they have good consistent damage. Especially after level 11, Mickey will have fairly short cooldown, can get in, get an in and out of fights. It's just the fact that you're also opting into an extended team fight against a Rise. And if we've learned anything, is that Rise does incredible damage, even in a 1v2 scenario. And there's Song Yoon gets caught again, nailed by the Tibber as Snowflower reacts with an ultimate of his own. But that is Gorilla and Prey once again getting a kill, except this time it goes on to Prey instead of Wisdom. Very easy, easy all in. Didn't even need the flash from Gorilla either, so just must have been too well, aggressive positioning from Sung Yoon. Sung Yoon didn't have flash either, so True. it's pretty easy to land that Tibbers. You basically can't even walk anywhere close to that brush based on the Tibbers range or you're gonna get hit by it. So good all in right there. Prey will be going for an Infinity Edge first. And how much can they do? Can they get this tower? before the big wave clear completes from Song Yoon is going to be the question. They don't want to go for a dragon after that kill, interestingly enough. Now, Lyra, again, let's talk about the vision from this team because that is definitely one of Anarchy's strengths. He saw that, the recall came in. Look how many wards just in a moment went into that bottom side jungle so they can keep eyes on that, du that duo lane. I mean, the pressure is off multiple lanes. In fact, all lanes can play super aggressively. You see in top, there's a pink and a red ward. So Ixu has complete information about basically every gank path. Kassin has a lot of information about the red side jungle as well. There's only so many places on the map that uh, wisdom can be and not be accounted for. So pinpoint warding, it didn't even take a coke. They had this before Hachani even joined the lineup. And also, there's not even a sight stone on the jungler yet, and they still have warding this good. Uh, this is just something that keeps impressing me about Anarchy, is how much information they're able to get early in the game. All I can speculate is that their item timings must be very purposeful. You can see two green wards in the infantry of both Cassidy and Lee Sin, both mobile, able to get more aggressive wards than standard mid laners who don't have that mobility. They're very smart about lighting up the wards, even on the relatively low income early game. Well, clear a ward also out of that river. That's one less pink for the Koo Tigers, who are warding a bit more defensively this game. Happy with the lead they've gotten so far. Kuro still falling behind in CS. Mickey has a very, very, er very early Rod of Ages. Super early Rod of Ages. It was about 10 minutes, I believe one minute on the timer. So we're thinking 21 minutes when it'll be at full power. I mean, Mickey also really hasn't even missed any CS yet. We can see right there doing incredibly well in that lane. Nice dueling here against Wisdom. Wisdom follow, but the Q misses. They're going to re-engage, actually. There's the ultimate from Victor. They're going in aggressively. Mickey's going to pick up the kill, but at what cost? Probably going to live. The spell shield dies. Ixu teleports in and going to get aggressed on, actually, here. And there's the Tibbers as well. Ixu under the turret does body slam out. But that was a good teleport from Smeb to help secure the two kills. Picks one up for himself as well. And this is the danger. When that wave clear is not there and you have the victor and the Sivir in the lane, goodbye mid turret. Sunyan's walked in very aggressively. The turret's probably not going to fall. Kuro can't get an auto attack in, but it might as well be dead. This is the sort of turret health where Wisdom can just tunnel in, kill the turret, and go for what would have been a turret dive. Honestly, Gorilla should have just stunned him right there and then taken the last auto on the turret. That definitely could have been taken safely by the Koo Tigers. Let's watch this replay again, though, because Wisdom just clearing out a pink ward. And Binky's the one that caused this fight to happen, went in very aggressively, got the nice burst onto Wisdom. But with the moment that the Q missed from Lyra, they probably should have backed away. It was always going to be, at best, an even trade after that. Very nice teleport from Smeb. Ixu can't make much happen. He's smart in getting away. Watch for the flash body slam. Doesn't get interrupted by the Tibbers, so it's nicely done there. Uh, yeah, really good mechanics on that. 
And also, I wanted to point out that Smeb had such a good read on that situation. He TP'd on the high ground and instantly flashed to finish off Lyra because what happened was Kuro moved the Chaos Storm onto Mickey to kill him, and he knew that with Smeb's positioning and the flash up that the kill on Lee Sin would have been secured. So like that's, that's great communication and teamwork. That's very impressive. The target selection of a settled lineup playing well. It's very hard to communicate in those small areas. Trying to create pressure around Dragon, but Dragon's already been DPS down. And first Dragon goes down to Koo. I mean, that's just a situation where... ...the Koo Tigers, or just one. But instead, the maximization of their resources and knowing which abilities are up and which summoners are up allows them to pick up two instead. So now they're in an awkward position here, Anarchy, because Snowfire is going for the roam, which has paid a lot of dividends on champions like Thresh. Issue is that the hurricane is completed on Callista, and she can't even enter lane. She has to push if she does get to the minion wave. Of course, Ku has had all this pressure around the dragon, and now the enemy blue buff finally groups back with Callista. But I feel like Ku are going to understand their ascendancy is primarily around the bottom side of this map. And it's just, I'm just so impressed by the Ku Tigers because we just we talked about it to death last season and early this season. How, and remember how the Koo Tigers started out this season. There was a game where they didn't even get a kill until after 40 minutes. This We never questioned their shot calling, their side wave control, their team fighting ability. These were all great. Their picket ban was strong for the most part. It was just that they played games where they got themselves in so much of an early hole that they just couldn't see out of it anymore and had to frantically play from behind. Sure, they got wins out of that because they were so good at all of these other factors, but it wasn't reliable and they needed to fix it. And they've really come in in the middle of this season and radically changed how aggressive they are on the map. I'm sure adding wisdom helped to a certain degree. I'm sure the, the lessening of the Cinder Hulk meta and the ability to play more aggressively again in the early game helped to a certain degree. But I think it's something that they really focused on and I think it's something that no Faye in particular has been very successful in instilling into this team quickly. I think it's plain to see across the board that the level of champions has gone up this season. A lot of the teams have gotten a lot better as oh. we miss off screen what we can only assume was an instant pick onto Cannon. I mean, so Florida didn't even have time to flash. So, yes. Seems like that is the answer. Uh, Prey and Gorilla continue to terrorize this bottom lane. But as the level of players improve, it just means that the previous weakness of Koo, just in their laning phase and their mechanical issues, we're going to see a replay of what we can only assume is instant death for Snowflower. Yep. Wow, Dead. that was a great combo from Prey to the follow-up there. Just auto ricochet, boomerang blade for what? Oh, goodbye, Sagyun. Okay, well, it's like Anarchy just coming apart at the seams now. And Koo playing around the hurricane and the fact that it's so easy to prey upon Sagyun. He can't even enter lane. He tried entering lane with his support spot, went to ward, died instantly, let himself get denied in the brush, and died anyway. This is what I hate about the, the Hurricane build, Papa Smithy. If you get into a team fight and you can hit like three people multiple times, and Ixu's just gonna be chain CC'd right here. Oh, gets out with the body slam actually, but not before he takes half his health bar and damage. Has a lot of sustain coming through from the passive and the spirit visage. I think this is a fine matchup. If you're thinking about champions that can build tank, but also lane against Ryze is a very shallow pull. So of course, ban Ryze is the obvious thing to take away from that. But Gragas has good base damages on his wave clear, and he hasn't been denied. In fact, he's 10 CS up. And here is Gorilla doing those Gorilla things. Coming into late, his flash is still up. He didn't even have to use it because he got face checked. Doesn't and have tippers though. Doesn't have bolts, but will that matter? And there's the continued W spam though that's gonna go down, flash for the chain. And that's going to be it. Sure, you could knock away the Annie, but that doesn't really help you not get CC'd by Smeb. For the first time in 17 minutes, the pressure is relieved from Callista, and of course, instantly applied in the top lane. Very nice rotation from Ku. They knew that Dragon hadn't spawned. They're going to take more standing gold off this map, and it's going back to what you said. What's going to be alive by the time that Kassadin hits 10 stack Water of Ages and Callista gets damage? And it's probably not much. Oh my, Smeb coming in from a flank actually uses CB not to the turret, but just to go after Sangyu. What a bold play. Ward, and goodbye Sangyu. It that wasn't was that easy. It wasn't that bold, Monte Cristo. <laughs> he has the targeted CC. It's already level five, so of course long enough to hit a point blank Q. I, I, I thought that wouldn't be quite so one-sided. <laughs> <laughs>
You were building up to a Jaws moment, <laughs> and it certainly was one. But uh, yeah, Sung Yoon, 0 4 and 0 with just a hurricane. There's still that miracle fight where Callista somehow mops up, but it's fast, fast window for that closing. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Well, another turret in the top side, a successful defense and a kill. I mean, Ku just playing the map absolutely beautifully. They right were invited now. to by this team comp, yeah. though. They had the wave career advantage. They had the strong lanes and the ganking jungler. But they're playing to their win conditions early and acting on them, rather than their previous win conditions, which were Trinity Force group up and try and brute force down turrets. This is Ku adapting in what is, was always going to be a more difficult season as every team around them got better. They spammed the solo queue, their mechanics are on point. Suddenly, laning phase no longer a big disadvantage as we could see the engage. Uh, Prey actually going to get ignited on the side. Mickey may take him out. Gorilla actually finds himself under the tower. Prey makes it out. Somehow, he's going to turn it around and take down a full HP Mickey with the help of Kuro. But that is one for two in favor of Anarchy. These are the sort of trades that definitely Favor the scaling teams. That's good picks coming through. But Smeb's still really healthy. We're going to see the engage from Snowfire. Goes into the back line. Smeb's still alive. We've seen Rises turn this around, but dies. And Callista has consistent damage. This is a big team fight win for Anarchy. Absolutely. They find the pick on the side there. Smeb getting kicked into a wall by Lyra for maximum CC. And Ku Tigers, a little bit crazy here. And you know, we did see this from Ku. We did see this when they played against Venu. Uh, they really invaded, over-invaded, over-pressured, and then found themselves at a disadvantage. Great engage from Ixu, though. Really nice, again, mechanically on this Gragas. And Gorilla just has to drop the Tibbers in a not particularly effectual way. And while Prey dies right here, this should be the end. The Ku Tigers need to get out and just defend their turret at this point. But you can see they want to fight here. Remember, Smeb not exactly at his peak power yet. And they see Callista at this point. They know they're opting into a three before. That's the big question. Maybe not accounting for the CC, but as you mentioned, Smep, he was basically CC the entirety of that fight. Couldn't do the consistent damage and healing that the multiple spell rotations provide, and it's good team fighting from Anarchy. And Kuro really just had the mana for one Chaos Storm right there. And there was no more follow-up damage from him, so. Who did this? Remember that fight against Spenu where they walked into the blue buff after being like 7-1 in kills? Interesting pattern we're seeing here. Pretty much exactly that same situation in this game. And that not going to be too good. No, you have to regard it almost as an unforced error. They had the information. They even knew that they would be outnumbered. Maybe just overhyping Ryze's power spike, not incorporating the fact that the CC is very strong on the Anarchy side. Now, they're going to try the Dragon. It looks like Anarchy don't have the vision to be able to compete, but they're at least going to have a look. Yeah, they're going to get some damage onto Kuro. There's the explosive cast. Kuro, or Gorilla, rather, has some flash backwards. Mickey on the flank. They're going to try and burn him down with the Chaos Storm. Flash from Wisdom. There's the Boomerang Blade over the wall. Snowflower gets the engage. And now the death rays really start coming through. Smeb is dead. Prey is moving forward. They need to kill Song Yoon. They're going to get Song Yoon. Lyra with a double kill, though. And this should be cleanup for the Tigers now that they have the victors still up. Prey Seeker, not enough. There's the slow. Will Wisdom get another tunnel? The answer is negative. And three for three, even trade, despite being 5,000 gold behind. Suits, Anarchy once again, they will lose the Dragon, it's only a second one, but Anarchy trading evenly after the early game that Ku had is only good for Anarchy. Absolutely, and it was really just a great flank from Mickey right there to catch Gorilla. I mean, Gorilla had to flash out because he got hit again in the front line by Ixu and then just got cleaned up, so Gorilla not in the best position at the start of that Dragon, and not really enough vision control really from Ku, and Anarchy's emphasis on wards does allow them to make plays like this from time to time. But remember, if you have an emphasis on wards, that means you're spending gold on it. It means that the gold lead that was 5,000 before that fight is probably an implied six or six and a half thousand, because it's not just sight stones, it's green wards they were picking to delay their items. To go three for three when you're spending all that extra gold on those consumables, again shows the power of Anarchy's comp with Bloodthirster and now Hurricane completed. I'm just excited that this is a competitive game after a 12-minute start that looked like Ku is going to run over this Anarchy team in 25 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Anarchy making a bid to get back into this game. Sang Yoon now going to get a tower. That's going to put things within about two and a half. 
And the standing gold actually accounts for most of the advantage. It's only 2, 000, uh, two turrets and uh, 3,000 gold, the advantage for Ku. We wondered how long Ku could keep their their foot on the accelerator and take down turrets and take down as much standing gold as possible. They've done the minimum in taking out the outer ring of turrets, but no more than that just yet. That's right. Well, they've held on to all of theirs up until that one kill, but if those outers go down, we are going to be looking at a dead even game, except in terms of that dragon. Smep walking up with this wave. He's going to try and save his turret, pop his ult to do so, and just clear out the wave. And even the sound effect from that desperate power is scary. It's enough to <laughs> cause Ixu to scamper away. I guess to me, you, you don't like uh, Hurricane Callista, and I can understand that. There's definitely a lot of scenarios where the bolts don't mean much. When you have this much peel, and especially when you've been so thoroughly denied, it's a huge two-item power spike. And okay, the third, the fourth item aren't going to add a lot of power, but given the scenario, being able to have this much power despite being so far behind your lane opponent is kind of a unique thing that only Callista can really offer from the AD carry role. It's just a matter of whether you actually are able to hit multiple bolts, bolts at a team fight is the issue for me because you need to be able to really put a lot of that damage down on many targets, and it's difficult to get into that position. And in a lot of comps, I agree. If Hecarim's running at you and you're going to be zoned and only get 70% attack speed because there's no bolts coming onto anyone else, absolutely 100%. But when it's Ryze who's just going to pop those Nikes and run straight at you, or the tunnel is going to come through, assuming you, of course, avoid the Gorilla Stun, there's a lot of potential that there'll be two people in fairly melee range or 300 range running at you, and I feel like Callista should be able to do work as Snowflower Celebratory Ultimate. Yeah, it's got to create the lightning circle around you. Not sure that must have just been a... He hit his key wrong or something like that because I really didn't really see a reason for him to be ulting right there. It's a light party, you know, <laughs> chilling in the mid lane, having a party. The electric rave going on with Cassidy. I mean, Cassidy looks like he could, he could go to a rave. He's got that gas mask thing going on. I know that's what happens at all the, with all the kids at the EDM dancing music festivals. What do you know about the kids at the raves, Monte Cristo? <laughs> um, that's not appropriate for on air. Fair. <laughs> all right, TP, Smeb with the home guards. They want the flank, they want the engage. What can they catch right here? They're able to zone off two members. And there's a W, he actually gets on to Kali Goodbye, Sung Yoon. Oh, Sung Yoon. smoked right there. Didn't have flash, no way to get out. So they get the pick. No objective to take. They're probably going to try and take this inner turret. This good wave clear from Gragas. He can just ult to reset the wave, but too much for Ku to pick up. Are they actually going to go here and try and dive this Wisdom with a very aggressive zone play? Tibbers and still available, no flash on Addy. No, 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 Tibbers is up. Uh, my apologies, still just the refresh of the timer. There he is, the big Care Bear on the screen. And taking a tower with him. Now they're just going to give 50 gold to Mickey, I guess. Hmm. Not sure about that one. Don't need, to, don't need to give up the Tibbers like that. Speaking of 50 gold, there's two Scuttle Crabs on the map. One of them just died. <laughs> Pretty still alive, though, so. Probably gives more than 50 gold as well. <laughs> he's worth, uh, he's worth, what, six Scuttle Crabs. Six scuttle crabs. Yeah. The dream of every jungler. <laughs> okay. We wondered where the builds would go this game, so we have some time now to check them out. Spirit Visage into Frozen Heart. So cooldown tank is what we expected. Maybe less flat health to synergize the, with the passive that the Righteous Glory might have provided. So I, I like building for the happy hour and having the extra 600 health just so that 2% or whatever the stat is at the moment is impactful. But very, very tanky nonetheless is the Gragas. Indeed he is, and uh, thinking about it, it's just his percent damage reduction that he has, too. Sure. Very, very strong. And his base damage is one of the reasons why he's so relevant as a jungler. No longer needs to build AP. Okay, the barrels don't hit as hard, but the, the Drunken Rage, the slow and the damage, means that he's always relevant as long as he lives, and with all the extra gold, he should be both sticky and long surviving in fights. Yeah, that first auto attack really hurts with the Drunken Rage. All right, well, Ku now wanting to play around this dragon and the Baron. Only with a 4K gold lead, and it's not going to be a flash for Gorilla to repeat the feat onto Song Yun in this next fight. No TP home guard either for the Rise, so pretty different conditions for the Ku Tigers as they head into this next objective. Anarchy definitely going to have a much easier time when it comes to. Uh oh, bye, Mickey. Never mind. <laughs> 
and that's why you don't use melee champions to clear wards. He was actually clearing a Rek'Sai tunnel. So <laughs> five gold or your life. Don't know quite about the exchange rate there, and this should be another turret. The wave clear's not there from Anarchy. They might try a desperation engage, but it's risky. And there you go. Ixu gets locked immediately, put in the rune prison, and he'll die there. Zongyun as well. Lots of prison deaths this game. And they're just going to push forward. It's really weird engage in a 5v4 scenario against Ryze, who has that targeted regular CC. They're at minimum going to lose their inhibitor in a situation where Anakin could have just backed away and lost an out of turret. Yep. Inhibitor down, Ku moves into total control of this game. How much are they going to go for right here? They have 20 seconds. They get another tower. I don't think they're going to get much more than that. Snowflower just gets it destroyed with another stun. They're going to just walking one by one into any stuns this game. And they literally lost the maximum from the one pick onto, <laughs> onto <laughs> It Cassidy. doesn't get much worse. They lost three turrets and two inhibitors and re-engaged 5v4 and died as well. So Anarchy, you had a great series <laughs> against Samsung. You're actually looking very competitive in this game, but uh, you just ga basically gifted an 8,500 gold lead to Ku. Yeah, that, that was... Uh Pretty impressive series of errors there from Anarchy, <laughs> starting with Mickey getting very close to a brush against it anywhere. Gorilla didn't even have to flash for that. He just simply walked up and tibbered him. I can confirm for the viewers that he did clear the uh, Rek'Sai tunnel, so five gold for that. <laughs> that's, that's worth five gold for the game. No <laughs> <sighs> getting pretty cute. Gets caught out in this situation. Fate's call is used defensively, so he will live. Not sure why they keep contesting areas where they don't have wards. Warding has been their biggest strong suit in the few victories they've picked up, but it's kind of letting them down at this point, understandably given that they've lost almost the entirety of their base. Well, can they actually steal this Baron? It is their final hope, really, no. in this series, and that is a negative. So now they have no hope. And what do we do with no hope? They need a new hope. Unfortunately, that's only going to be game two, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Where, where is Luke Skywalker when you need him? They have Snowflower. Sounds like Skywalker. <laughs> I suppose, very generally. I don't know if he's been granting them any advantages with his lightning parties in the mid lane. Though. His use of the Force, questionable. Well, if he, was, uh, if he was a Sith, his use of lightning might be quite impressive. It's true. All right. Here we go. Nice. Ish explosive cast. <laughs> I like how you reevaluated the explosive cast there. Well, it kept them off the turret for about three seconds. Smeb is basically god mode on Rise with the Banshee Veil complete. It can disrespect everyone on the lineup. All the peel we talked about, at least one of those peel spells is going to be completely negated. Baron buff super minions means this game is only on a very short timeline. Yeah, final inhibitor will go down. Ku just looking for that very clean win, taking out every objective. Lyric actually going to kick Wisdom back. Wisdom flashes. There's the lightning party, but it's too late. Gorilla gets a, a counter tippers down, and this is the part where everyone on Anarchy dies. Even Mickey. Goodbye. Not quite enough Riftwalks there. Very nice win from Ku. Very clean game. There was a 10-minute period where Anarchy had a chance, and that's probably a significant thing given how the first 10 minutes went, but Ku in the end just preyed upon the rookie mistakes of Anarchy. Unfortunately, they crept back into their play, made those unforced errors. The 4v5 engaged by Gragas really sticking out. Yeah, I, I'm a, a bit curious, though, about the Ku Tigers as well, because this is, this is the second game in a row where they come out with just guns blazing, they pay, play a very clean early game, they pick up a bunch of kills, and then they just overextend. They try and push their lead just a little bit too fast, and they get punished for it, and then they take dumb fights. So would you say that they've arrested their 0 to 15 minute weaknesses and moved them from 15 to 25 minutes? I don't think it's quite that bad yet, because it's never really like Anarchy was on par with them again. Okay. So impressed with how much they've developed. And Kuro is the person that we're looking for that's really been symptomatic of their rise in these last eight games. About an 8.8 .8 KDA playing out of his skin after what's been, basically since Champions Finals, a real rough patch for this player. Indeed. Well, what do we have drop here in picks and bands? We had a bit of a, an odd draft in the last game, we can say. Lots of pocket bands, interestingly. Uh, and that opened up the first big rise. The, the second round 
Callista Grogas. These are all first pick worthy champions that came out in the first three. Cool. And so with the Rise ban, so they're definitely not wanting to see any Rise hijinks from Ixu. Again, we haven't seen Rise from many players. Smems was obviously really fearful. And the top lane bans actually continue with the Rumble ban. Uh, interesting. Last game, it was Anarchy really focusing on that mid lane. And this time, the Tigers, who took out the Maokai, took out the Hecarim in the last game, trying to shut down Ixia. We'll see what their red side strategy will be. Alistair not going to be able to be per first picked by Anarchy in this one. It'll be a Gragas first pick, you'd have to think, if it's available. Much more likely to be Lyra on the jungle Gragas, but they've already flexed the pick, so now it does loom as a flex pick for Anarchy. Remains to be seen whether Gragas will be available for first pick, as Sivir is the ban coming through for Anarchy. No more scuttle crabbing for Prey, or for Sunyun for that matter. Kalista is not going to be dealt with one more time, even though they contained the Kalista quite well in that last game. Just too big of a risk, so where's Anarchy go? Almost certainly to the Gragas, like you're saying in this scenario. It's one of those situations where Hecarim and Maokai are both available. It's probably going to be the top lane matchup, whatever snapped away. So I think Gragas as a priority makes a lot of sense. I don't know. I think Smep could easily play Gnar into either of the, the Hecarim or the Maokai in this game. So we may not see the, the tree versus the horse. But wow, that would be a very high priority placed on Maokai. I don't think you do that. I think at the cost of Gragas, especially Wisdom, who is an excellent Gragas player, it's a bit of a head scratcher. It is an early power spike top laner. Maybe you can make teleport plays around, but valuing it that high over the jungle pool availability, you have to expect Gragas to be snapped up on the first round on the red side. What this says to me, Papa Smithy, is Lyra is playing Lee Sin or something like that again, and they just want to make plays on the top lane and try and shut down Smeb if he does take something with lower mobility. Now, if you Smeb here, I think you just take something extremely safe, and that'll be the Corky lock-in. Uh, Koo Tigers love to early pick Corky, Corky Gragas. I don't think you seem to know much about Smeb, considering you're talking about safety. I don't think he's going to pick safety. Is it going to be Riven time again? I don't know if I would play Riven into something like Maokai Lee Sin. Hmm. Again, the victor is available. Obviously, Mickey doesn't really care if Kuro plays that champion. Mickey plays victor himself, so he's going to be comfortable blind picking it. But remember that Kuro also a big time Cassidy guy. So we could see that same reverse matchup. He's not going to be able to punish in quite the same way with a Zed, but could still play the cast. Almost certainly the last pick on the red side looms to be Kuro's mid lane, and so no real rush to lock in the mid lane. They want them to blind pick one of their lanes, and they've already picked the Maokai on the blue side. We're waiting for an answering top laner. Nah does loom as a possibility, as you mentioned, one of Smeb's main champions, but do you see something different coming through? Most teams would take the top here, but Ku is a team that likes to last pick Riven on red side, so they'd be suspicious. It would definitely be suspicious. Uh, it also is harder to bully the Maokai than it is to bully a Rumble with the Riven. Um, the Lucian here, the Thresh, you know, Snowflower is going to be getting that really strong champion for him, where he is able to really make those big plays on the map. It and looks look like a- Look at those summoner spells, Monte Cristo. Smeb's going for the Fizz. The Cinder Hulk Fizz is incoming. Gorilla says, I've got an MVP performance on this, Annie. I'm going to take her again. We still dream for a player like Mickey on everyone's favorite new assassin in Echo. Hasn't been locked in. It's a pretty safe choice. Cassidy certainly wouldn't be a safe choice. Especially in the jungle. Especially in the jungle. True. Now, do they think that this Fizz is going into the mid lane for Kuro? If I was Anarchy, I, this doesn't look like a Kuro champion to me. This looks like a Smep champion. And in this meta, there's like, on one hand, you could count the people still playing Fizz mid. You can think of players like Pawn who would still opt into it, but almost exclusively a top lane champion outside of Tucson. In certain counter matchups in mid lane, sure. obviously we saw Crown play it and do very well against Easy Hoon, but you wouldn't blind pick it. Speaking of blind picks, though, LeBlanc is still available in what is it, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth round of picks. The champion has been banned earlier today. Lot, lot of mid game power from Anarchy, but potential lack of damage in the late game. Ku, I think you take the victor here. Otherwise, you're going to lack wave clear. The Kassadin is obviously going to do very well against the LeBlanc in lane, but I mean, Echo's a good choice. I'm not sure how good Kuro would be on this champion. 
to me, this would be something that is much more Smeb focused as well. But I, the Fizz Cassidy is such a risk when you have a Lucian on the other side who can really push down those towers. I, and you know Snowflower is going to be all up in your business in the mid lane too, throwing hooks at you with that Thresh. With the first rotation Sivir, maybe it could be the case, but with Sivir banned away, this is a high-risk cast and if it's locked in. Now, it is a good lane matchup. Almost, I would go so far as to say, a favorable lane matchup for Cassidy against the LeBlanc. It will be locked in. There is downside to this Kukom. There is risk, especially around wave clear. Yes. Yes, there is. Uh, but they are going to have some decent damage right here. I am not a big fan of, like, quirky Cassidy and Fizz. Personally, Annie, Gragas, that's five magic damage champions. Yeah, this is the this Aegis is game of all Aegis games. It's a great pick comp if you can make it work. Um, but this is this is a bit of a this is a bit of a wacky comp from the Koo Tigers. I feel like a a top team would really punish this. I'm not sure if Anarchy is going to be able to legitimately pull that off. Um, also, Mickey hasn't been as good on LeBlanc as he has been on some of his other assassins like Zed or Ari. Um, just hasn't been quite, quite as, quite as impressive. And you are pointing out something very interesting, which is that Wisdom is taking teleport in the jungle. So teleport smite master Yi is definitely a career thing. He changed at the last second. Okay, that was literally a zero <laughs> second change. It was okay. zero second change over to flash. So it looked like we were going to see something wacky, but just wipe our brows and be glad that it didn't go through. So. This game, Anarchy has a very well-rounded composition, good advantages in lane. Koo Tigers need to hold on to those turrets early if they want to make it good late. So let's get into game two, Anarchy versus the Koo Tigers. Even Anarchy's cheer is uh, chaotic. I love it. At least they got one out there this game after what no doubt was the main contributor into their fall in game one. That was actually the most chaotic cheer I think I've ever heard from a Korean audience here in this studio. So top lane Fizz. It's often something we talk about. I know your feelings on it. You're not a big fan. You remain to be convinced. I think in a lot of ways I agree, especially in the wave clear rounds it's weird to have a champion in top lane that doesn't even max their wave clear ability of course maokai can happily max the arcane smash trade and clear waves as he so needs fizz will max the w the sea stone trident just for trading maybe max the Q, the e second the playful trickster sometimes even maxes it third one thing i will tell you in the late game mickey and sung are the only damage dealers on the anarchy side and tank fizz cinder hulk fizz can do one thing it's isolate a target and buy a lot of time. So you build that Frozen Heart, you build the Cinder Hulk, you run at Sung Yoon. If he's forced out of the fight, you only have burst damage from Mickey, and maybe that's enough to take Ku over the line in 5v5 fights. Well, the issue with LeBlanc, though, is that if you want to try and get the damage down, you you run the risk of getting within Gorilla's W stun range. True. And that can be really brutal. And it's very easy to hit that ability on a Distortion LeBlanc smep. Me taking the wolves here, of course. Lane swap initiated by Anarchy. That's actually going to be quite good, I feel, for the Koo Tigers. They're going to dodge Lucian when he's going to be most strong against this bottom side. But it's also going to free up Snowflower, who we've seen is quite good at the old roam. Both these champions, excellent roamers from level two Snowflower, and of course, level one from the Annie can have access to AoE stuns. So. So a lot of pressure potentially could be put in mostly the mid lane, you'd have to think, given that's the only isolated matchup. Yeah, Koo just going to start playing pretty back early on right here. Kuro going to get zoned out after Mickey hits that faster level two. And he actually, uh, Kuro, we didn't mention this, he stayed in, he stayed in base there for an extra potion uh, at the start of this game. So Koo are jungling on the weak side. They have no backup whatsoever on the top. It looks like they're going to get the Raptors. Oh, and they spots out. Can we see 3v3 action around the red when the red itself no. is claimed away? But no. surprising pathing from Koo. 
Yeah, checking that out right there. Maybe a bit greedily, but no, yeah, that is not a fight you take early on. And while I agree with you, the fact that they sent three members to the top side seems pretty curious to me. Yeah, it does. There's certainly a risk with that. Now they're going to go on to Mickey right now. Mickey, not a lot of mana. They have so many oh. different angles against Mickey, and he's so far up the lane. I think this is going to be the end of Mickey right here. There's Wait for the distortion. Yeah, they're looking for it. They want to get it. They're going to flash W. Okay, goodbye. She opens up a lot of space. Can Koro chase with the flash? He definitely can. Well played by Wisdom and first blood to Koo. Yeah, there's basically no way, if you're that far forward, even with a distortion, even with a flash, you can get out of that. There's too many gap closers and stuns to be safe. Now, if the kill doesn't go on to Kuro, it's a little bit of a side bonus right there, but man, that is sloppy. Mickey shouldn't be playing that far forward when he knows exactly where the Koo Tigers are. He had the information. They walked away through the middle lane out of the red buff. They were seen by that sapling. So you have to know which side of the lane they're on right there, considering they wrap back around and can't make plays like that. Also early enough in the game that all his friends, whether it's Lyra or Snowflower, didn't have access to wards to give him defensive vision. I guess it kind of begs the question, does he need the vision to function? Because he is so often so far extended up the lane, it grants him, it grants him advantages, it grants his team advantages, both chip damage onto turrets and extra CS and gold for himself, but it comes at the cost of a very binary playstyle. Anarchy, if they do one thing every game, it's play around Mickey. Yeah. That is certainly true. Smeb going to sneak into the top side now after the assist on that kill alongside Gorilla, who's already set up. And he's going to find himself with just a little bit of a CS advantage. And in the meantime, throughout all of those shenanigans, Prey has a really good freeze going on on the bottom side. So Ku with a big, big edge in terms of their waves right now. We actually saw Prey very aggressively freezing the wave. Very nice mechanics to do that. And that's led to a situation where a Maokai who has so many different ranged farming options, especially for a tank, is being out CS thoroughly by Smeb on this Fizz. 20 to 9, <laughs> given the two champions, is massive. Not to mention that Ixu went back and picked up another Doran's ring, so he's invested a lot in his early game. He's going to put it in behind in terms of his larger, later itemization. Kuro going to get chained in the mid lane. I'm really interested to watch Anarchy in the second half of the season, because if they continue to play the way they do, where you know that Mickey will overextend consistently, it feels like they'll be found out more and more. And okay, they don't have a lot of wins to their name, but they're right up there in terms of those bottom teams. They're looking on the sixth or seventh position, despite the fact that they are so consistent at overextending in the mid lane around their carry. Well, for them to get sixth would take, I think, quite a fall from grace from one of the top six teams right now. There's pretty much a, a, a very clear dividing sure. line between the top six and the bottom four teams in this league at the moment. Uh, they, it's obviously a very long season. We're not even halfway through yet. And here we go. There's a flash play. Gorilla going to get the stun off, though. Wisdom is there lurking. And he's going to get a big, big slow, but not before Lyra. And Song Yu net the kill onto a squishy little Annie. You say the Annie's squishy, but the important point there is that Snowfire was level two when that begun, but the aggressors are the ones that profit. It's a big win to get a lot of experience on the Snowfire, but in an even 3v3 with all those base stats being the Vange of Koo, that's actually quite significant for Anarchy. Well, it Wisdom was just late, though. True. It was a thing. The burst had already come down, so much easier for Anarchy to clean up, considering it was initiated by their team. So, well, you know, it was a nice gank, mm -hmm. well executed, and this Fizz, too, it, doesn't have a lot of damage yet, and he's not going to. Just going back right now, doesn't have that Cinder completed, so it's a Skirmisher Saber and a Ruby Crystal only for him. I'd be pretty disappointed with Smeb if I saw Oh, oh Ixu oh. face checks. A lot of CC and damage. Flashes away. Is it going to be enough? Doesn't look like it. Looks like he's inevitably going to fall here. The kill credit goes over to Wisdom. Probably could have given it to Prey, but might have had to use a Summoner to pick it up. Definitely could have given that one to Prey, Papa Smithy. Uh, the Ignite was already burning down. He needed, like, one more auto attack. A little bit unnecessary for the second kill of the game, as well as the first to go over to Wisdom. They, they do translate the kill into a Dragon, but look how much damage Smeb is taking onto his tower. This is one of the issues with the Fizz, is that you have no way to stop 
this from happening. Even in the 1v1, the wave clear is just so incredibly poor. And what you want to do as Fizz is lane against the Mount. Right? That's a situation where you can trade quite happily. Okay, he still has a farming advantage, but you're at least competitive in that lane. When you're standing next to Lucian Thresh, you basically have to exit lane wherever possible. So they give up a dragon, but it should be, at least in the next few minutes, seconds, sorry, traded for this top turret. Yeah, and that is what is going to happen. Even the wave reversing right now, back towards Songyun. Might be some nice extra farm there for Iksu once he makes it into the top side. Wisdom and Gorilla do prevent Mickey from doing too terribly much to this tower. And Smab sticks around a little bit longer just to push up. So what I was mentioning before is the build from Fizz. Cinder Hulk into Trinity Force we see sometimes. This is not that sort of game because they have effectively five damage dealers. Even Gragas does very good damage from the jungle. All Fizz needs to do is force Sung Yoon or Mickey out of a fight. So stack those statistics. Frozen Heart, a Spirit Visage or the uh, Banshee Veil will be fine. And get on top of a Squishy. He doesn't need to spend 4,000 gold on damage. But this is the question, Papa Smith. I'm listening. If you're just going to build tank stats this game, uh -huh. why not just go for the Gnar, which is going to be able to accomplish much the same thing? I think Fizz is pretty unique at getting on top of a carry like Lucian, for example. If you hit the fish, and that's a big if, it's very difficult to hit. Normally, you should be peeled away. But the fish itself is four seconds of CC between the slows and the knockup. He's very slippery. He's able to skip past the small amount of CC available. That's the flash from Gorilla onto Snowflowers. Just for the stun, doesn't have access to Tibbers, but Snowflowers, Squishy, they knew he didn't have the flash. And Wisdom, it's another celebratory cask for his third kill of the game. <laughs> well, throwing a bash down there. That's the issue for me, Papa, is that when I look at this and I look at the fact that Nar also may have been able to save his turret in the top lane and has you know, at least marginally better wave clear, and still has all of that upside of the Fizz that isn't determined around a single skill shot. That's where I'm like... You see, I don't necessarily agree with you, just because, to me, Nar is not a reliable champion. And it's not to say that Fizz is, it's just that Nar, he can't tussle people up unless he's very split with his timing on the Mega Nar. That's his big CC impact that will impact a backliner. If you run at someone as Fizz, you can at least do decent trade damage with your auto attacks, you have slows, you're able to, say for example, draw out the Twisted Advance, then Playful Tricks to throw it and throw the fish onto the AD carry. Yes, you are fish reliant, whether it's an AP build, or in this case, just for tussling up the back line, but I don't mind the fizz in this situation, barring, of course, the laning weaknesses that it brings. Yeah, and that, like I said, that's, that's one of my major issues with it. I just think that, oh, goodbye. Well, that looks a lot like last game. Yeah, they're playing around bottom lane very intelligently. Sung Yun dies again only once this game, but of course both the bottom laners have fallen. You know what I love actually that I hadn't considered about this Annie previously in this specific game? This against, game in particular, okay. Against this specific opponent, I should say, from the Ku Tigers, is that you know Snowflower roams a lot, and what it does is it punishes roams insanely hard if Gorilla just sits there and focuses on Sung Yun. And that's, we've seen a lot of kills so far in this game where Snowflower just hasn't been there. And led to a 32 CS advantage. And as you mentioned, it's just so hard to lane against instant cast CC. That's the unique thing about Annie is there's no cast time whatsoever on her W. Just one of the reasons why whenever Rise is back in meta, you remember, no cast time on his W either. Instant CC, so powerful in the league. It's a reason why Nautilus... A, a good pick, but the Nautilus ultimate, not an engage option because the travel time is so long. Well, they do pick up a uh, tower in the mid lane for it, Anarchy. So they get something in the end, but they, they lost one in bottom as well, just to sort of equalize right there. And to me, Papa, I mean, Sang Yoon, they, they initiated this lane swap. They opted out of the period of time where Lucian can really bully the Corky in the lane before Prey hit level six. And now a 30 CS advantage for Prey. Prey did a great job of freezing as well to get this advantage, but we really shouldn't be seeing Prey with this large of a CS edge at 12 minutes into the game. I mean, more significantly than CS, he's got a Trinity Force and he's able to rotate into mid lane, because remember, taking the bottom lane turret already, Limited wave clear from LeBlanc. Okay, can use the Mimic Distortion to clear one set of waves, but then the Trinity Force autos 
And we're going to get a reminder of why Corky was such an important pick band before Cinderhawk is that Ku is an excellent team about around playing around Corky Power Spikes. They've done it so much. Nothing has changed in terms of turret damage from a Corky. And LeBlanc only has the minimal options to deal with it. Yeah, indeed. And Mickey, he's been shut down this game. He's 0-1-0. He hasn't had a chance to roam. Uh, they're coming up on another dragon right here where Anarchy still not with a lot of MR yet, and Ku gonna be in a really, I think, pretty good position here to deal some damage thanks to the Annie ultimate being back up, and I mean, that flash for Gorilla nearly up as well. Probably will be in time for the dragon fight. Well, let's take stock of the fact that you're giving Ku the advantage in a dragon fight with scaling abound. Rod of Age just completed, so 10 minutes away, Cinderhawk effectively a scaling item. Cinderhawk not even completed by Smab. Only instant power is from the Trinity Force from Corky, which, granted, is a big power spike. But you look down at Anarchy's side, the only scaling option they've taken is the Avarice Blade from Lucian. But you're still saying team fights look difficult for Anarchy. Well, Ixu here, the, at least he's going to go for the Catalyst as well. So he doesn't, didn't go for the Quick Righteous Glory, which actually may have been a very key item to lock down Kuro before he gets even tankier. You can't really lane against a Fizz with yeah, no true. magic resist. <laughs> Given the, the, the way the uh, Seastone Trident autos work, you, you get so many procs of the uh, Spectre's the, Cowl as you're dealing with it. So I think yeah. you have to itemize yeah, into it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Damage over time, definitely a big factor. And Kuro and Anar, or Mickey rather, He's trading a little bit, but Kuro gets the better of that with the help of his spell shield. To activate the dragon with the death sentence doesn't quite land it onto prey. But they don't have any vision around this dragon right now. Anarchy. They have good pink wards around their own blue, but that's not really an area you're going to be playing around. Okay, it's pressure off of Mickey, but Mickey's already got the turret, so you can't really parlay the pink wards they've invested to on the top side into much of an advantage. There was a wacky mass recall there, actually, from the Ku Tigers. They just placed their wards and then ditched them. Strange. And it is going to be the damage build from Smab. I shouldn't be surprised, but maybe it's going to be just a sheen into tank, but I just don't see the point, really. I think that the only point to picking Fizz here, if you're going to pick it instead of a, a, a more standard tank, is to build damage. Then you have effectively four and a half damage dealers. It's, yeah. I, I agree, it's too much. I mean, we've talked, we've got to talk this to death at this point. Neither of us are big fans of the Ku Tigers comp this game. But they're making it work, and at Anarchy, awkwardly buying the immediate power on mass and not really being able to opt into fights even around Dragon. I mean, they, they had a free Dragon right there. Ku was definitely had just pieced out of the pit, but they got too afraid to actually take it. There were a lot of pings down there. They took out a pink ward. They didn't see anything, and they have Tremor sense as well. Lyra was right in front of the pit, but they just didn't do it. In this weird scenario where Mickey's certainly not on Zed this game, he's on LeBlanc, but he's actually still opting into a split push against Cassidy. And I guess both of them are highly maneuverable, so not likely to get collapsed upon, but very weird scenario where we have the AD carries farming in mid and the offlane matchup of LeBlanc versus Cassidy. Well, Gorilla really wants this one. Mickey's going to walk in. He has no idea Gorilla snuck in through the brushes. And there's a double W, Mickey, just using it to push the wave a little bit. Flash Tibbers could have been used there. Was still pretty risky. Just going to show himself now as Gorilla. I think the priority's more on the Dragon than getting the one pick. Yeah, it was. But Mickey's ultimate going to be back up soon. Another death sentence onto the Dragon right there. I think it was a bit of a missed opportunity. I think they could have killed the LeBlanc or chunked her out, and it would have been worthwhile. But instead, here comes some damage down onto Wisdom, the Sigil of Malice. And Dragon goes to Gragas. TP onto the Lantern, however, and they're just going to collapse onto Lyra. Prey gets tied up in the back line with the Twisted Bench, flashes into the choke point, though. There is the actual W out of the fight. Snowflower now gets focused down by Spev. Everyone's so low except for Ixu. And yeah, Smeb gonna have to run. Kuro comes in with a W and then the Q to take him out. Ixu just getting burned down and tag teamed by a variety of members of Ku. And there you go. One more Sheen here. Uh, it's gonna get slowed by the sapling and then the arcane smash, but Wisdom, he's got enough to tie him up here. But that's gonna be a kill to Wisdom instead of onto a bigger threat. Really nice skirmishing coming through from the Ku Tigers. They use the fact that the maneuverability in fights between the Grateful Trickster 
and the Kassan. So this teleport was after the objective already gone down. So it's a bit questionable, especially with Lyra dying instantly. This fight is very, very even because Prey is the first person to fall from the Ku Tiger. But as the fight develops, they're just not able to fight around their carries well enough. And Smeb is healthy and does consistent damage in these unorganized skirmishes. Well, I think the other key right there is Mickey actually did end up dying because he went into the back line because he just got CC'd. And also, I really didn't like the Lantern TP to start that fight. That was a poor place to TP, and also it wasted Lantern entirely. There was nothing beneficial from the Dark Passage right there that came through. No shields, no ability to reposition some of your carries. Imagine if that Lantern had been up and used to get Mickey out of that back line out of, after killing Prey instead, or something like that. Instead, Smeb just going to go 1v1 onto Mickey right here. Able and to use the Mimic Distortion to get away. I think even simpler, Monte Cristo. They're opting into a fight after Dragon's already dead. The objective was dead. At what best, it was going to be what? A two-for-two two trade, maybe some sort of even trade. They never were in a position in terms of their items to get a massive team fight victory. Smeb's caught out by Lyra. There's a lot of members here. Need to hit the hook. Don't. Now, remember, he doesn't max Faithful Trickster, but he's still pretty damn tanky and walks away. Wow, Mickey's so low that he's afraid of moving too far forward. Now, they're going to get the tower as a result, but no kill. Four people on the bottom side. What are they going to give up? Looks like they're going to trade one for one. Maybe trading. more, actually. Yeah, the mid turret for the Bantar is not an ideal trade whatsoever. We'll see if Ku want to keep going. They can definitely keep going. They've got this Trinity Force. Get as much damage down as they can. The Trinity Force, Corky. No wave clear. Maokai just walking up. Doesn't have teleport. It will be a bit of a suicide teleport if he was to come in. Two, tele two turrets for one. Easy advantage there for Ku. Hard to base race with a Corky at this young point in the game. You're just not going to be able to do that much. And they pay for it. They don't get the kill on the Smeb. Smeb just deftly avoiding that death sentence. And now blue buff for Kuro. Kuro starting to really come into his own right now. Six stacks done on that Rod of Ages as he closes in so on the final half of that item. Let's guess. Educated guess is going to be Zonya's second coming through for Cassidy and diving into the back line, then a really tanky fizz as well. Smep's caught out, hasn't used Playful Tricks yet, uses it now, still gets hit by the chains, but no one has died. And Gorilla jumped on immediately, but Cor Corky really doing a lot of damage with the Gat in that choke point right there. Prey totally protected as Smep comes through. Four for one. They got Gorilla, but not before he dropped the Timbers, so it didn't really matter. And then Prey just had such good positioning. He out, he put down so much damage in that team fight. And superior item timing is reigning too. Remember, we mentioned in Champions Select, like the Aegis Dream, five magic damage dealers from Ku. No sign of an Aegis, the more selfish choice by Lyra of the Spectre's Cow. In fact, an Aegis is completed by Wisdom. Just don't have the item timings to opt into these fights. And if they keep skirmishes, they're going to keep losing the fights. Yeah, that, that Aegis lack is really hurting Anarchy. And there is Prey in the booth having a giggle about how easy it was just to stand there and not move and hit all of his auto attacks in that last fight. The Siege Turret approach. <laughs> it's like, I should have been playing Kog'Maw, damn it. <laughs> Don't give him any uh, inkling of that. He'll play the Kog'Maw before. Oh, too. I know. The Juggermaw, the glorious Juggermaw of the Ku Tigers will return. We're really going to find Lyra right here. They know it. So this blue buff, man, that'd be a nice pickup for Prey right now, but probably going to get Smite. Nope, Prey gets it. Okay. Didn't have Smite available as far as I can see, Eve. Hard to tell on our monitor, but looks like it was on cooldown. Smiting the blue buff if you're Lyra is not ideal, but giving it away to Prey, just that much worse. It's so bad at this point of the game. In fact, this is where Corky really shines. And Prey going to be having just that many more rockets right here. Uh, no Baron Vision whatsoever from Anarchy, and they've got to face check it sooner rather than later. Gorilla will be lurking in the brush with the Flash and the Bear. Teleports use. Remember, Fizz, even building full tank, has very good damage to the Baron with the W Max. They're going to DPS it down. They've even got Gorilla on uh, lookout duty. It's down to 1800 health. It's going to be a free Baron to Ku. Well, Anarchy. Mickey trying to get that split push. They want to take something at the very least for this Baron, but that Howard is... Howard recalls yeah. pretty quick. 
And so are home guard boots. Smeb is there in an instant, not even letting him have a turn right now. Fish, fish, fish onto Iksu. There's the knockup. Lantern will get him out. No one to be able to stand up. Wow, very big flash there from Wisdom. Get the mini stun into the wall, but they put down the box. Will Prey be able to fall? Looks like he doesn't have Valkyrie. They get away, but they don't even pick up that one turret to trade for Baron. No, nor did they fall back to get this dragon right now. So that is going to be number three for the Koo Tigers, barring some sort of big, big steal here. It's going to reset a little bit. Oops, and then Gragas simply smites it away. So they've got everything they want, the Koo Tigers. Only three kills this game for Anarchy in just a, a dominant showing from Koo. And when it comes to win conditions, remember, that's a third dragon at 23 minutes. So 35 minutes is a very early Five Dragon stack, if they so need it. I'm very uh, reluctant to say they do, given they're running down with Baron Buff. They have the item timings. How is Lucian ever going to do damage to a level 13 Cassidy with Zonyas, or even just the Fizz we talked about, who's a damage threat with the Sheen? Two damage threat, but one of them is going to be tussled up by the Assassins. Tibbs Oops. comes down. Yeah, tried to catch Mickey, but that didn't work out for them. Didn't even get much damage. Mickey still... Coming in hard with the poke from the side. That actually may break up this Baron, or this uh, this siege attempt right here on the mid lane. Prey has to get back, does get hit by the Sigil. Double Sheen procs, whether it's the Sheen from Fizz or the Trinity Force means the turret is not long for this world. And looking really, because it's a really aggressive use of the ultimate, but there's the re-engage. And here we go, Sveb has to start auto-attacking Ixu with the front side. Kuro is already all over Snowflower and Mickey in the back. Zonya's popped it. Sang Yun finds him all alone against Smeb and Prey. The fight broken up. And that's one of those situations where this Cassidy and this this uh, this Fizz really excel. There's no way to peel them off. They even have Baron buff minions to help with their trades. It's gonna be at minimum the inhibitor. Short death timers, so the game might not end here, but then again, we'll wait to see what Ku wanna do. That's one of those situations where I really disagree with Anarchy's choice to engage because Gorilla's ult was down, and that's really the only way that Ku has to actually initiate a dive. Mm -hmm. And they have to dive. There are, there's Cassidy and, and Fizz on the enemy team. They are in melee range. You're going to be able to clear those waves, I think, well enough with a culling and with Ws uh, from the LeBlanc. I mean, engaging right there into back into the ante was probably one of the worst things they could do in that situation. I'm kind of iffy on that particular one. You look down Anarchy's lineup against Baron buff minions, the culling and LeBlanc's wake that doesn't do much. Still probably going to need to be a dive. It was just a window they tried to exploit with the tippers down. Maybe they'd be able to have Sung Yoon not get tussled up, but the Fizz Fish was still up. He took him out in the back line. That's kind of a moot point. Yeah, I mean... With this big of a lead, Ku obviously looking to close this one out very quickly and doing a good job. We haven't seen the mistake that we saw in the last time of pushing too greedily and really giving Anarchy any kind of hope or window back into this game. So why why is the Fizz working in this game and just hasn't worked reliably? We saw the game from CJ where, okay, they just picked a really poor comp when it with no sorts of wave clear, but... Why is this in this game, is the Fizz working better? Is it because Kugo are a much better team than Anarchy, yes. or is the Fizz actually contributing anything you need? Sure. I mean, when you have this big of an advantage, I think that you can skirmish very efficiently, especially if, as we're moving into this Trinity Force build from Fizz. Um, and how are you going to stop the split push from Fizz either is a, is a big question. But uh, to me, this is okay. As Wisdom gets grabbed right there, nearly bursts it down. He does die at the end. Now it's going to be a 5v4. Ixu going to catch Prey. But Prey Valkyrie's back out. They burn down Ixu with the help of the fish. And here's the big reversal coming around with the help of Prey. And Kuro uses that rip walk, gets the force pulse. And now on the outside, Kuro just wants to back off. Mickey wants the one kill. Zonia's baited, though. And Mickey will pay. Kuro gets some sweet ice cold revenge after the bait. And there's one thing Smeb can do on Fizz, it's turret, it's, it's dive the fountain. Very nice play there, they back away, just, they got a pick, but 5v4, we mentioned the fact that it's effectively five damage dealers, with Gragas dead, it's certainly four damage dealers, and they still made them pay. And Smeb gonna get a second glacial shroud. Uh -huh. Like you do, you know. 
Nope, figured it out. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't get much of a refund value. Uh, has to pick up just a ruby crystal in exchange. Well, I, I, yeah, I think this is just a symptom of the Koo Tigers being so far <laughs> ahead that any complaints that we have about their composition as Wisdom wave clears with his ultimate are rather moot. Has to flash. Just Takes advance comes on. There is a round as well. They don't think they have the damage here though. And Smeb does damage and is super tanky. Doesn't matter. Turns out like you're not tanky to five people. Yeah, you shut it, he gets shut down, but amazingly he takes Snowflower with him, finds the squishiest target. Remember, Wisdom doesn't have ult to actually finish this fight now. He's getting a little silly for the Tigers. Yep, they've got a big gold lead, 14,000 gold. The next dragon spawns in 40. Realistically, they shouldn't need any of those things, given they've broken the base in top and bottom, have two inhibitors, but Koo definitely do switch off at weird points <laughs> in games, sometimes too early that can actually hold them behind, but in this game, probably not going to be punished too hard. Uh, Ixu going in, but he is just melted as he's focused down by all the damage dealers from Koo. Lyra. The second to fall, and there's a, a very aggressive foul forward. Coordinate with the Riftwalk. Death Sentence is going to miss. And Snowflower destroyed for the double kill. Kuro wants three. He gets three as they finish out this game. Super Minions there to assist, and so is Smeb after TPing in. This will be an easy win, a cakewalk for the Koo Tigers. And Monty, in the second half of this first round, the Koo Tigers have rampaged through, I believe, four teams it is now. So. Lots of points in a row. Kuro's looked excellent. Another 20 KDA game. In fact, infinite KDA having not died. 8, 0, and 12. This guy right up there with Faker in terms of form players in the league. Yeah, and you, you can't really say enough good things about Kuro's recent performance. Again, he came in as, what, number two in terms of kills overall in this league, just behind Goom. Now he's going to be number one. 16 kills in this series. Yeah, by a long shot, actually going to be number one here, and his performance just continues to improve. He seems to really play well his, with his team. Is he that guy who's going to make you the big play like Faker will that wins you the game? That's probably not him, but he's playing really so impressed with how much they've developed. And Kuro is the person that we're looking for that's really been symptomatic of their rise in these last eight games, about an 8.8 .8 KDA, playing out of his skin after what's been, basically since Champions Finals, a real rough patch for this player. Indeed. Well, what do we have drop here in picks and bands? We had a bit of a an odd draft in the last game, we can say. Lots of pocket bands, interestingly. Uh, and that opened up the first pick rise. The, the second round, Callista Gragas. These are all first pick worthy champions that came out in the first three. Cool. And so with the rise band, so they're definitely not wanting to see any rise hijinks from Ixu. Again, we haven't seen rise from many players. Smems was obviously really fearful. And the top lane bans actually continue with the Rumble ban. Uh, interesting. Last game, it was Anarchy really focusing on that mid lane. And this time, the Tigers, who took out the Maokai, took out the Hecarim in the last game, trying to shut down Ixia. We'll see what their red side strategy will be. Alistair not going to be able to be per first picked by Anarchy in this one. It'll be a Gragas first pick, you'd have to think, if it's available. Much more likely to be Lyra on the jungle Gragas, but they've already flexed the pick, so now it does loom as a flex pick for Anarchy. Remains to be seen whether Gragas will be available for first pick, as Sivir is the ban coming through for Anarchy. No more scuttle crabbing for Prey, or for Sanyun for that matter. Kalista is not going to be dealt with one more time, even though they contained the Kalista quite well in that last game. Just. Too big of a risk, so where's Anarchy go? Almost certainly to the Gragas, like you're saying in this scenario. It's one of those situations where Hecarim and Maokai are both available. It's probably going to be the top lane matchup, whatever snapped away. So I think Gragas as a priority makes a lot of sense. I don't know. I think Smep could easily play Gnar into either of the, the Hecarim or the Maokai in this game. So we may not see the, the tree versus the horse. But wow, that would be a very high priority placed on Maokai. I don't think you do that. I think at the cost of Gragas, especially Wisdom, who is an excellent Gragas player, it's a bit of a head scratcher. It is an early power spike top laner. Maybe you can make teleport plays around, but valuing it that high over the jungle pool availability, you have to expect Gragas to be snapped up on the first round on the red side. 
what this says to me, Papa Smithy, is Lyra is playing Lee Sin or something like that again, and they just want to make plays on the top lane and try and shut down Smeb if he does take something with lower mobility. Now, if you're Smeb here, I think you just take something extremely safe, and that'll be the Corky lock-in. Uh, Koo Tigers love to early pick Corky, Corky Gragas. I don't think you seem to know much about Smeb, considering you're talking about safety. I don't think he's going to pick safety. Is it going to be Riven time again? I don't know if I would play Riven into something like Maokai Lee Sin. Hmm. Again, the victor is available. Obviously, Mickey doesn't really care if Kuro plays that champion. Mickey plays victor himself, so he's going to be comfortable blind picking it. But remember that Kuro also a big time Cassidy guy. So we could see that same reverse matchup. He's not going to be able to punish in quite the same way with a Zed, but could still play the cast. Almost certainly the last pick on the red side looms to be Kuro's mid laner, so no real rush to lock in the mid lane. They want them to blind pick one of their lanes, and they've already picked the Maokai on the blue side. We're waiting for an answering top laner. Nah does loom as a possibility, as you mentioned, one of Smeb's main champions, but do you see something different coming through? Most teams would take the top here. But Koo is a team that likes to last pick Riven on red side, so... It'd be suspicious. It would definitely be suspicious. Uh, it also is harder to bully the Maokai than it is to bully a Rumble with the Riven. Um, the Lucian here, the Thresh, you know, Stoflyer is going to be getting that really strong champion for him, where he is able to really make those big plays on the map. It and looks look like... Look at a those summoner spells, Monte Cristo. Smeb's going for the Fizz. The Cinder Hulk Fizz is incoming. Gorilla says, I've got an MVP performance on this, Annie. I'm going to take her again. We still dream for a player like Mickey on everyone's favorite new assassin in Echo. Hasn't been locked in. It's a pretty safe choice. Cassidy certainly wouldn't be a safe choice. Especially in the jungle. Especially in the jungle. True. Now, do they think that this Fizz is going into the mid lane for Kuro? If I was Anarchy, I, this doesn't look like a Kuro champion to me. This looks like a Smeb champion. And in this meta, there's like, on one hand, you could count the people still playing Fizz mid. You can think of players like Pawn who would still opt into it, but almost exclusively a top lane champion outside of Tucson. In certain counter matchups in mid lane, sure. obviously we saw Crown play it and do very well against Easy Hoon, but you wouldn't blind pick it. Speaking of blind picks, though, LeBlanc is still available in what is it, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth round of picks. It's a champion that's been banned earlier today. Lot, lot of mid game power from Anarchy, but potential lack of damage in the late game. Ku, I think you take the victor here. Otherwise, you're going to lack wave clear. The Kassadin is obviously going to do very well against the LeBlanc in lane, but I mean, Echo's a good choice. I'm not sure how good Kuro would be on this champion. To me, this would be something that is much more Smeb focused as well. But I, the Fizz Cassidy is such a risk when you have a Lucian on the other side who can really push down those towers. I, and you know Snowflower is going to be all up in your business in the mid lane too, throwing hooks at you with that Thresh. With the first rotation Sivir, maybe it could be the case, but with Sivir banned away, this is a high risk cast and if it's locked in. Now it is a good lane matchup, almost I would go so far as to say a favorable lane matchup for Cassidy against the LeBlanc. It will be locked in. There is downside to this coup comp. There is risk, especially around wave clear. Yes. Yes, there is. Uh, but they are going to have some decent damage right here. I am not a big fan of like quirky Cassidy and Fizz. Personally, Annie, Gragas, that's five magic damage champions. Yeah, this is the this Aegis is game of all Aegis games. It's a great pick comp if you can make it work. Um, but this is this is a bit of a this is a bit of a wacky comp from the Koo Tigers. I feel like a, a top team would really punish this. I'm not sure if Anarchy is going to be able to legitimately pull that off. Um, also, Mickey hasn't been as good on LeBlanc as he has been on some of his other assassins like Zed or Ari. Um, just hasn't been quite, quite as, quite as impressive. And you are pointing out something very interesting, which is that Wisdom is taking teleport in the jungle. So teleport smite master Yi is definitely a career thing. He changed at the last second. Okay, that was literally a zero <laughs> second change. It was okay. zero second change over to Flash. So it looked like we were going to see something wacky, but just wipe our brows and be glad that it didn't go through. So.
This game, Anarchy has a very well-rounded composition, good advantages in lane. Koo Tigers need to hold on to those turrets early if they want to make it good late. So let's get into game two, Anarchy versus the Koo Tigers. Even Anarchy's cheer is uh, chaotic. I love it. At least they got one out there this game after what no doubt was the main contributor into their fall in game one. That was actually the most chaotic cheer I think I've ever heard from a Korean audience here in this studio. So top lane Fizz. It's often something we talk about. I know your feelings on it. You're not a big fan. You remain to be convinced. I think in a lot of ways I agree, especially in the wave clear rounds it's weird to have a champion in top lane that doesn't even max their wave clear ability of course maokai can happily max the arcane smash trade and clear waves as he so needs fizz will max the w the sea stone trident just for trading maybe max the Q, the e second the playful trickster sometimes even maxes it third one thing i will tell you in the late game mickey and sung are the only damage dealers on the anarchy side and tank fizz cinder hulk fizz can do one thing it's isolate a target and buy a lot of time. So you build that Frozen Heart, you build the Cinder Hulk, you run at Sung Yoon. If he's forced out of the fight, you only have burst damage from Mickey, and maybe that's enough to take Ku over the line in 5v5 fights. Well, the issue with LeBlanc, though, is that if you want to try and get the damage down, you you run the risk of getting within Gorilla's W stun range. True. And that can be really brutal. And it's very easy to hit that ability on a Distortion LeBlanc smep. Me taking the wolves here, of course. Lane swap initiated by Anarchy. That's actually going to be quite good, I feel, for the Koo Tigers. They're going to dodge Lucian when he's going to be most strong against this bottom side. But it's also going to free up Snowflower, who we've seen is quite good at the old roam. Both these champions, excellent roamers from level two Snowflower, and of course, level one from the Annie can have access to AoE stuns. So. A lot of pressure potentially could be put in mostly the mid lane, you'd have to think, given that's the only isolated matchup. Yeah, Koo just going to start playing pretty back early on right here. Kuro going to get zoned out after Mickey hits that faster level two. And he actually, uh, Kuro, we didn't mention this, he stayed in, he stayed in base there for an extra potion uh, at the start of this game. So Koo are jungling on the weak side. They have no backup whatsoever on the top. It looks like they're going to get the Raptors. Oh, and they spots out. Could we see 3v3 action around the red when the red itself no. is claimed away? But no. surprising pathing from Koo. Yeah, checking that out right there. Maybe a bit greedily, but no, yeah, that is not a fight you take early on. And while I agree with you, the fact that they sent three members to the top side seems pretty curious to me. Yeah. It does. There's certainly a risk with that. Now they're going to go on to Mickey right now. Mickey, not a lot of mana. They have so many oh. different angles against Mickey, and he's so far up the lane. I think this is going to be the end of Mickey right here. There's Wait for the distortion. Yeah, they're looking for it. They want to get it. They're going to flash W. Okay, goodbye. She opens up a lot of space. Can Koro chase with the flash? He definitely can. Well played by Wisdom and first blood to Koo. Yeah, there's basically no way, if you're that far forward, even with a distortion, even with a flash, you can get out of that. There's too many gap closers and stuns to be safe. Now, if the kill doesn't go on a Kuro, it's a little bit of a side bonus right there, but man, that is sloppy. Mickey shouldn't be playing that far forward when he knows exactly where the Koo Tigers are. He had the information. They walked away through the middle lane out of the red buff. They were seen by that sapling. So you have to know which side of the lane they're on right there, considering they wrap back around and can't make plays like that. Also early enough in the game that all his friends, whether it's Lyra or Snowflower, didn't have access to wards to give him defensive vision. I guess it kind of begs the question, does he need the vision to function? Because he is so often so far extended up the lane, it grants him, it grants him advantages, it grants his team advantages, both chip damage onto turrets and extra CS and gold for himself, but it comes at the cost of a very binary playstyle. Anarchy, if they do one thing every game, it's play around Mickey. Yeah. 
That is certainly true. Smeb going to sneak into the top side now after the assist on that kill alongside Gorilla, who's already set up. And he's going to find himself with just a little bit of a CS advantage. And in the meantime, throughout all those shenanigans, Prey has a really good freeze going on on the bottom side. So Ku with a big, big edge in terms of their waves right now. We actually saw Prey very aggressively freezing the wave. Very nice mechanics to do that. And that's led to a situation where a Maokai who has so many different ranged farming options, especially for a tank, is being out CS thoroughly by Smeb on this Fizz. 20 to nine, <laughs> given the two champions, is massive. Not to mention that Ixu went back and picked up another Doran's ring, so he's invested a lot in his early game. He's gonna put it in behind in terms of his larger, later itemization. Kuro gonna get chained in the mid lane. I'm really interested to watch Anarchy in the second half of the season, because if they continue to play the way they do, where you know that Mickey will overextend consistently, it feels like they'll be found out more and more. And okay, they don't have a lot of wins to their name, but they're right up there in terms of those bottom teams. They're looking on the sixth or seventh position, despite the fact that they are so consistent at overextending in the mid lane around their carry. Well, for them to get sixth would take, I think, quite a fall from grace from one of the top six teams right now. There's pretty much a, a, a very clear dividing sure. line between the top six and the bottom four teams in this league at the moment. Uh, they, it's obviously a very long season. We're not even halfway through yet. And here we go. There's a flash play. Gorilla going to get the stun off, though. Wisdom is there lurking. And he's going to get a big, big slow, but not before Lyra. And Song Yu net the kill onto a squishy little Annie. You say the Annie's squishy, but the important point there is that Snowfire was level two when that begun, but the aggressors are the ones that profit. It's a big win to get a lot of experience on the Snowfire, but in an even 3v3 with all those base stats being the Vange of Ku, that's actually quite significant for Anarchy. Well, it Wisdom was just late, though. True. It is the thing that burst had already come down, so much easier for Anarchy to clean up, considering it was initiated by their team. So, well, you know, it was a nice gank, mm -hmm. well executed, and this Fizz, too, it, doesn't have a lot of damage yet, and he's not going to. Just going back right now, doesn't have that Cinder completed, so it's a Skirmisher Saber and a Ruby Crystal only for him. I'd be pretty disappointed with Smeb if I saw Oh, oh Ixu oh. face checks. A lot of CC and damage. Flashes away. Is it going to be enough? Doesn't look like it. Looks like he's inevitably going to fall here. The kill credit goes over to Wisdom. Probably could have given it to Prey, but might have had to use a Summoner to pick it up. Definitely could have given that one to Prey, Papa Smithy. Uh, the Ignite was already burning down. He needed, like, one more auto attack. A little bit unnecessary for the second kill of the game, as well as the first to go over to Wisdom. They, they do translate the kill into a Dragon, but look how much damage Smeb is taking onto his tower. This is one of the issues with the Fizz, is that you have no way to stop this from happening. Even in the 1v1, the wave clear is just so incredibly poor. And what you want to do as Fizz is lane against the Malpa. That's a situation where you can trade quite happily. Okay, he still has a farming advantage, but you're at least competitive in that lane. When you're standing next to Lucian Thresh, you basically have to exit lane wherever possible. So they give up a dragon, but it should be, at least in the next few minutes, seconds, sorry, traded for this top turret. Yeah, and that is what is going to happen. Even the wave reversing right now, Back towards Song Yoon. Might be some nice extra farm there for Ixu once he makes it into the top side. Wisdom and Gorilla do prevent Mickey from doing too terribly much to this tower. And Smab sticks around a little bit longer just to push up. So what I was mentioning before is the build from Fizz. Cinder Hulk into Trinity Force we see sometimes. This is not that sort of game because they have effectively five damage dealers. Even Gragas does very good damage from the jungle. All Fizz needs to do is force Sung Yoon or Mickey out of a fight. So stack those statistics, Frozen Heart, a Spirit Visage, or the uh, Banshee Veil will be fine, and get on top of a Squishy. He doesn't need to spend 4,000 gold on damage. But this is the question, Papa Smith. I'm listening. If you're just going to build tank stats this game, uh -huh. why not just go for the Gnar, which is going to be able to accomplish much the same thing, I think Fizz is pretty unique at getting on top of a carry like Lucian, for example. If you hit the fish, and that's a big if, it's very difficult to hit, normally you should be peeled away. But the fish itself is four seconds of CC between the slows and the knockup. 
he's very slippery. He's able to skip past the small amount of CC available. That's the flash from Gorilla onto Snowflowers. Just for the stun, doesn't have access to Tibbers, but Snowflowers, Squishy, they knew he didn't have the flash. And Wisdom, it's another celebratory cask for his third kill of the game. <laughs> well, throwing a bash down there. That's the issue for me, Papa, is that when I look at this and I look at the fact that Nar also may have been able to save his turret in the top lane and has, you know, at least marginally better wave clear and still has all of that upside of the Fizz that isn't determined around a single skill shot, that's where I'm like... You see, I don't necessarily agree with you just because, to me, Nar is not a reliable champion. And it's not to say that Fizz is, it's just that Nar, he can't tussle people up unless he's very split with his timing on the Mega Nar. That's his big CC impact that will impact a backliner. If you run at someone as Fizz, you can at least do decent trade damage with your auto attacks. You have slows. You're able to, say, for example, draw out the Twisted Advance, then Playful Tricks to throw it and throw the fish onto the AD carry. Yes, you are fish for Lion, whether it's an AP build, or in this case, just for tussling up the backline. But I don't mind the Fizz in this situation, barring, of course, the laning weaknesses that it brings. Yeah, and that, like I said, that's that's one of my major issues with it. I just think that, oh, goodbye. Well, that looks a lot like last game. Yeah, they're playing around bottom lane very intelligently. Sangyun dies again, only once this game, but of course, both the bottom laners have fallen. You know what I love, actually, that I hadn't considered about this Annie previously in this specific game? This against, game in particular, okay. Against this specific opponent, I should say, from the Koo Tigers, is that you know Snowflower roams a lot, and what it does is it punishes roams insanely hard if Gorilla just sits there and focuses on Sangyun. And that's we've seen a lot of kills so far in this game where Snowflower just hasn't been there. And it's led to a 32 CS advantage, and as you mentioned, it's just so hard to lane against instant cast CC. That's the unique thing about Annie is there's no cast time whatsoever on her W. Just one of the reasons why whenever Rise is back in meta, you remember, no cast time on his W either. Instant CC, so powerful in the league. It's a reason why Nautilus, a, a good pick, but the Nautilus ultimate, not an engage option because the travel time is so long. Well, they do pick up a uh, tower in the mid lane for it, Anarchy. So they get something in the end, but they, they lost one in bottom as well, just to sort of equalize right there. And to me, Papa, I mean, Sang Yoon, they, they initiated this lane swap. They opted out of the period of time where Lucian can really bully the Corky in the lane before Prey hit level six. And now a 30 CS advantage for Prey. Prey did a great job of freezing as well to get this advantage, but we really shouldn't be seeing Prey with this large of a CS edge 12 minutes into the game. I mean, more significantly than CS, he's got a Trinity Force, and he's able to rotate into mid lane, because remember, taking the bottom lane turret already, limited wave clear from LeBlanc, okay, can use the Mimic Distortion to clear one set of waves, but then the Trinity Force autos, and we're gonna get a reminder of why Corky was such an important pick band before Cinderhawk, is that Ku is an excellent team about around playing around Corky power spikes. They've done it so much. Nothing has changed in terms of turret damage from a Corky, and LeBlanc only has the minimal options to deal with it. Yeah, indeed. And Mickey, he's been shut down this game. He's 0-1-0. He hasn't had a chance to roam. Uh, they're coming up on another dragon right here where Anarchy still not with a lot of MR yet. And Ku going to be in a really, I think, pretty good position here to deal some damage thanks to the Annie ultimate being back up. and. I mean, that flash for Gorilla nearly up as well. Probably will be in time for the dragon fight. But let's take stock of the fact that you're giving Ku the advantage in a dragon fight with scaling abound. Rod of Age just completed, so 10 minutes away. Cinderhawk effectively a scaling item. Cinderhawk not even completed by Smeb. Only instant power is from the Trinity Force from Corky, which, granted, is a big power spike. But you look down at Anarchy's side, the only scaling option they've t taken is the Avarice Blade from Lucian. But you're still saying Team fights look difficult for Anakin. Well, Ixu here, the, at least he's going to go for the Catalyst as well. So he doesn't, didn't go for the Quick Righteous Glory, which actually may have been a very key item to lock down Kuro before he gets even tankier. You can't really lane against a Fizz with yeah, no true. magic resist. <laughs> Given the, the, the way the uh, Sea Stone Trident autos work, you, you get so many procs of the uh, Spectre's the, Cowl as you're dealing with it. So I think yeah. you have to itemize yeah, into it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Damage over time, definitely a big factor. And Kuro and Anar, or Mickey rather, is trading a little bit, but Kuro gets the better of that with the help of his spell shield. And activate the dragon with the death sentence. Doesn't quite land it onto Prey. 
but they don't have any vision around this dragon right now. Anarchy. They have good pink wards around their own blue, but that's not really an area you're going to be playing around. Okay, it's pressure off of Mickey, but Mickey's already got the turret, so you can't really parlay the pink wards they've invested to on the top side into much of an advantage. There was a wacky mass recall there, actually, from the Koo Tigers. They just placed their wards and then ditched them. Strange, and it is going to be the damage build from Smep. I shouldn't be surprised, but maybe it's going to be just a sheen into tank, but... I just don't see the point, really. I think that the only point to picking Fizz here, if you're going to pick it instead of a, a, a more standard tank, is to build damage. Then you have effectively four and a half damage dealers. It's, yeah. I, I, I agree, it's too much. I mean, we've talked, we've got to talk this to death at this point. Neither of us are big fans of the Koo Tigers comp this game. But they're making it work, and at Anarchy, awkwardly, Buying the immediate power on mass and not really being able to opt into fights even around dragon. I mean, they they had a free dragon right there. Koo was definitely had just pieced out of the pit, but they got too afraid to actually take it. There were a lot of pings down there. They took out a pink ward. They didn't see anything, and they have tremor sense as well. Lyra was right in front of the pit, but they just didn't do it. In this weird scenario where Mickey's certainly not on Zed this game. He's on LeBlanc, but he's actually still opting into a split push against Cassidan. I guess both of them are highly maneuverable, so not likely to get collapsed upon, but very weird scenario where we have the AD carries farming in mid and the offlane matchup of LeBlanc versus Cassidy. Well, Gorilla really wants this one. Mickey's going to walk in. He has no idea Gorilla snuck in through the brushes. And there's a double W, Mickey, just using it to push the wave a little bit. Flash Tibbers could have been used there. Was still pretty risky. Just going to show himself now as Gorilla. I think the priority's more on the Dragon than getting the one pick. Yeah, it was, but Mickey's ultimate going to be back up soon. Another death sentence onto the Dragon right there. I think it was a bit of a missed opportunity. I think they could have killed the LeBlanc or chunked her out, and it would have been worthwhile. But instead, here comes some damage down onto Wisdom, the Sigil of Malice. And Dragon goes to Gragas. TP onto the Lantern, however, and they're just going to collapse onto Lyra. Bray gets tied up in the back line with the Twisted Bench, flashes into the choke point though. There is the actual W out of the fight. Snowflower now gets focused down by Smeb. Everyone's so low except for Iksu. And Smeb gonna have to run. Kuro comes in with a W and then the Q to take him out. Iksu just getting burned down and tag teamed by a variety of members of Ku. And there you go, one more sheen here. Uh, it's gonna get slowed by the sapling and then the arcane smash, but Wisdom, he's got enough to tie him up here, but that's gonna be a kill to Wisdom instead of onto a bigger threat. Really nice skirmishing coming through from the Koo Tigers. They use the fact that the maneuverability in fights between the Rayful Trickster and the Cassin. So this teleport was after the objective already gone down. So it's a bit questionable, especially with Lyra dying instantly. This fight is very, very even because Prey is the first person to fall from the Koo Tiger, but as the fight develops, they're just not able to fight around their carries well enough, and Smeb is healthy and does consistent damage in these unorganized skirmishes. Well, I think the other key right there is Mickey actually did end up dying because he went into the back line because he just got CC'd. And also, I really didn't like the Lantern TP to start that fight. That was a poor place to TP, and also it wasted Lantern entirely. There was nothing beneficial from the Dark Passage right there that came through. No shields, no ability to reposition some of your carries. Imagine if that Lantern had been up and used to get Mickey out of that back line out of, after killing Prey instead or something like that. Instead, Smeb just gonna go 1v1 onto Mickey right here. Able and to use the Mimic Distortion to get away. I think even simpler, Monte Cristo. They're opting into a fight after Dragon's already dead. The objective was dead. At what best, it was going to be what? A two for two trade, maybe some sort of even trade. They never were in a position in terms of their items to get a massive team fight victory. Smep's caught out by Lyra. There's a lot of members here. Need to hit the hook. Don't. Now remember, he doesn't max Bayful Trickster, but he's still pretty damn tanky and walks away. Wow, Mickey's so low that he's afraid of moving too far forward. Now they're going to get the tower as a result, but no kill. Four people on the bottom side. What are they going to give up? Looks like they're going to trade one for one. 
the Maybe trade. more, actually. Yeah, the mid turret for the Bantar is not an ideal trade whatsoever. We'll see if Ku want to keep going. They can definitely keep going. They've got this Trinity Force. Get as much damage down as they can. The Trinity Force, Corky, no wave clear. Maokai just walking up, doesn't have teleport, and will be a bit of a suicide teleport if he was to come in. Two, tele two turrets for one. Easy advantage there for Ku. Hard to base race with a Corky at this young point in the game. You're just not going to be able to do that much. And they pay for it. They don't get the kill on the Smeb. Smeb just deftly avoiding that death sentence. And now blue buff for Kuro. Kuro starting to really come into his own right now. Six stacks done on that Rod of Ages as he closes in so on the final half of that item. Let's guess. Educated guess is going to be Zonya's second coming through for Cassidy, diving into the back line, then a really tanky Fizz as well. Smep's caught out, hasn't used Playful Tricks yet, uses it now, still gets hit by the chains, but no one has died. And Gorilla jumped on immediately, but Cor Corky really doing a lot of damage with the Gat in that choke point right there. Prey totally protected as Smep comes through. Four for one. They got Gorilla, but not before he dropped the Tibbers, so it didn't really matter. And then Prey just had such good positioning. He out, he put down so much damage in that team fight. And superior item timing is reigning too. Remember, we mentioned in Champions like the Aegis Dream, five magic damage dealers from Ku. No sign of an Aegis, the more selfish choice by Lyra of the Spectre's Cow. In fact, an Aegis is completed by Wisdom. Just don't have the item timings to opt into these fights. And if they keep skirmishes, they're going to keep losing the fights. Yeah, that, that Aegis lack is really hurting Anarchy. And there is Prey in the booth having a giggle about how easy it was just to stand there and not move and hit all of his auto attacks in that last fight. The Siege Turret approach. <laughs> it's like, I should have been playing Kog'Maw, damn it. <laughs> Don't give him any uh, inkling of that. He'll play the Kog'Maw before. Oh, too. I know. The Juggermaw, the glorious Juggermaw of the Ku Tigers will return. We're really going to find Lyra right here. They know it. So this blue buff, man, that'd be a nice pickup for Prey right now, but probably gonna get smite. Nope, Prey gets it. Okay. Didn't have smite available as far as I can see, Eve. Hard to tell on our monitor, but looks like it was on cooldown. Smiting the blue buff if you're Lyra is not ideal, but giving it away to Prey, just that much worse. It's so bad at this point of the game. In fact, this is where Corky really shines. And Prey gonna be having just that many more rockets right here. Uh, no Baron Vision whatsoever from Anarchy, and they've got to face check it sooner rather than later. Gorilla will be lurking in the brush with the Flash and the Bear. Teleports use. Remember, Fizz, even building full tank, has very good damage to the Baron with the W Max. They're going to DPS it down. They've even got Gorilla on uh, lookout duty. It's down to 1800 health. It's going to be a free Baron to Ku. Well, Anarchy. Mickey trying to get that split push. They want to take something at the very least for this Baron, but that Howard is... Howard recalls yeah. pretty quick. And so are home guard boots. Smeb is there in an instant, not even letting him have a turret right now. Fish, fish, fish onto Ixu. There's the knockup. Lantern will get him out. No one to be able to stand up. Wow, very big flash there from Wisdom. Get the mini stun into the wall, but they put down the box. Will Prey be able to fall? Looks like he doesn't have Valkyrie. They get away, but they don't even pick up that one turret to trade for Baron. No, nor did they fall back to get this dragon right now. So that is going to be number three for the Ku Tigers, barring some sort of big, big steal here. It's going to reset a little bit. Oops, and then Gragas simply smites it away, so they've got everything they want. The Ku Tigers, only three kills this game for Anarchy in just a, a dominant showing from Ku. And when it comes to win conditions, remember that's a third dragon at 23 minutes, so 35 minutes is a very early five dragon stack if they so need it. I'm very uh, reluctant to say they do, given they're running down with Baron Buff. They have the item timings. How is Lucian ever gonna do damage to a level 13 Cassidy? with Zonyas, or even just the Fizz we talked about, who's a damage threat with the Sheen. Two damage threat, but one of them is going to be tussled up by the Assassins. Tibbs Oops. comes down. Yeah, tried to catch Mickey, but that didn't work out for them. Didn't even get much damage. Mickey still coming in hard with the poke from the side. That actually may break up this Baron, or this, uh, this siege attempt right here on the mid lane. Gray has to get back, does get hit by the Sigil. 
double Sheen procs, whether it's the Sheen from Fizz or the Trinity Force means the turret is not long for this world. And looking really, because it's a really aggressive use of the ultimate, but there's the re-engage. And here we go, Smeb has to start auto-attacking Ixu with the front side. Kuro is already all over Snowflower and Mickey in the back. Zonya's popped it. Sang Yun finds him all alone against Smeb and Prey. The fight broken up. And that's one of those situations where this Cassidy and this this uh, this Fizz really excel. There's no way to peel them off. They even have Baron buff minions to help with their trades. It's gonna be at minimum the inhibitor. Short death timers, so the game might not end here, but then again, we'll wait to see what Ku wanna do. That's one of those situations where I really disagree with Anarchy's choice to engage because Gorilla's ult was down, and that's really the only way that Ku has to actually initiate a dive. Mm -hmm. And they have to dive. There are, there's Cassidy and, and Fizz on the enemy team. They are in melee range. You're going to be able to clear those waves, I think, well enough with a culling and with Ws uh, from the LeBlanc. I mean, engaging right there into back into the Annie was probably one of the worst things they could do in that situation. I'm kind of iffy on that particular one. You look down Anarchy's lineup against Baron buff minions, the culling and LeBlanc's wake that doesn't do much. Still probably going to need to be a dive. It was just a window they tried to exploit with the tippers down. Maybe they'd be able to have Sung Yoon not get tussled up, but the Fizz Fish was still up. He took him out in the back line. That's kind of a moot point. Yeah, I mean... With this big of a lead, Ku obviously looking to close this one out very quickly and doing a good job. We haven't seen the mistake that we saw in the last time of pushing too greedily and really giving Anarchy any kind of hope or window back into this game. So why why is the Fizz working in this game and just hasn't worked reliably? We saw the game from CJ where, okay, they just picked a really poor comp when it with no sorts of wave clear, but why is this in this game, is the Fizz working? But is it because Kugo are a much better team than Anarchy, yes. or is the Fizz actually contributing anything you need? Sure. I mean, when you have this big of an advantage, I think that you can skirmish very efficiently, especially if, as we're moving into this Trinity Force build from Fizz. Um, and how are you going to stop the split push from Fizz either is a, is a big question. But to me, this is okay. As Wisdom gets grabbed right there, nearly bursts it down. He does die at the end. Now it's going to be a 5v4. Ixu going to catch Prey, but Prey Valkyrie's back out. They burn down Ixu with the help of the fish, and here's the big reversal coming around with the help of Prey. And Kuro uses that rip walk, gets the Force Pulse, and now on the outside, Kuro just wants to back off. Mickey wants the one kill. Zonia's baited, though, and Mickey will pay. Kuro gets some sweet ice-cold revenge after the bait. And there's one thing Smeb can do on Fizz, it's turret, it's, it's dive the fountain. Very nice play there, they back away, just, they got a pick, but 5v4, we mentioned the fact that it's effectively 5 damage dealers, with Gragas dead, it's certainly 4 damage dealers, and they still made them pay. And Smeb gonna get a second Glacial Shroud. Uh -huh. Like you do, you know. Nope, figured it out. <laughs> Doesn't get much of a refund value. Uh, has to pick up just a ruby crystal in exchange. Well, I, I yeah, I think this is just a symptom of the Koo Tigers being so far <laughs> ahead that any complaints that we have about their composition as Wisdom Wave clears with his ultimate are rather moot. Has to flash. Just Takes advance, comes on. There is a round as well. They don't think they have the damage here, though. And Smeb does damage and is super tanky. Doesn't matter. Sounds like you're not tanky to five people. Yeah, you shut it, he gets shut down, but amazingly he takes Snowflower with him, finds the squishiest target. Remember, Wisdom doesn't have ult to actually finish this fight now. He's getting a little silly for the Tigers. Yep, they've got a big gold lead, 14,000 gold. The next dragon spawns in 40. Realistically, they shouldn't need any of those things, given they've broken the base in top and bottom, have two inhibitors, but... Who definitely do switch off at weird points in games, sometimes too early that can actually hold them behind, but in this game, probably not going to be punished too hard. Uh, Ixu going in, but he is just melted as he's focused down by all the damage dealers from Ku. Lyra, the second to fall, and there's a, a very aggressive foul forward, coordinated with the Riftwalk, death sentence going to miss, and Snowflower destroyed for the double kill. Kuro wants three, he gets three, as they finish out this game, Super Minions 
there to assist, and so is Smeb after TPing in. This will be an easy win, a cakewalk for the Koo Tigers. And Monty, in the second half of this first round, the Koo Tigers have rampaged through, I believe, four teams it is now, so lots of points in a row. Kuro's looked excellent, another 20 KDA game. In fact, infinite KDA having not died, 8-0 and 12. This guy, right up there with Faker in terms of form players in the league. Yeah, and you, you can't really say enough good things about Kuro's recent performance. Again, he came in as what? Number two in terms of kills overall in this league, just behind Goom. Now he's going to be number one. 16 kills in this series. Yeah, by a long shot, actually. Going to be number one here. And his performance just continues to improve. He seems to really play well his, with his team. Is he that guy who's going to make you the big play like Faker will that wins you the game? That's probably not him. But he's playing...